Good morning. On this uh, uh, lovely early spring morning, we welcome you. Uh, my name is Claudia Stravato, and I'm the worship associate this morning and part of the team that's uh, bringing this service to you wherever you may be. Uh, we are an inclusive congregation that welcomes you as you are, inclusive of all your identities, complexities, and situations. We welcome your whole self, even if it isn't fully assembled, because we recognize that we are all a work in progress and that we are all in this together. This service is being posted on our YouTube channel and our Facebook page so that folks can uh, watch it again later and feel free to share it with your friends. Um, we're now going to have a minute for greeting each other with a wave or a handshake, uh, and then I'll call us back together. We'll start with our opening affirmation. Love is the doctrine of this church. The quest for truth is its sacrament, and service is its prayer. To dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge in freedom, to serve humankind in fellowship, for these high purposes do we unite in worship. Please have us uh, be seated. We have a, a wonderful program for you today on um, Georgia O'Keeffe and to set a tone before I light the chalice, I'd like to read a few quotes um, that will add to the um, atmosphere. Art is a line around your thoughts, Gustav Klimt. To be an artist is to believe in life. Rene Magritte, the true use of art is first to cultivate the artist's own spiritual nature, George Ennis. Um, great art picks up where nature ends, Mark Chagall. Um, I'm going to uh, light the chalice with this reading. The best in art and life comes from a center, something urgent and powerful, an idea or a, a motion that insists on being. From that insistence, a shape emerges and creates its structure out of passion. If you begin with a structure, you have to make up the passion, and that's very hard to do. Roger Rosenblatt.
Right now we're going to have our traditional story for all ages, and Donna Mosley is going to present that. The story is The Color Collector by Nicholas Solis and Renia Metalanu. I'm not sure I did that last name right. Uh, Nicholas resides in Austin, and I thought that was really interesting. And Renia is in Greece, living on the coast with her family. All right. She lived near me. We walked home the same way. I was on one side. She on the other, always quiet, always alone, every day the same, until one day, the day she picked something up. The wind blew strong. A red candy wrapper did somersaults. It landed at her feet. It hugged her shoe. Violet picked it up, the bright red wrapper. Then it was gone, disappearing into her backpack. She looked up. She looked at me. She waved. Then her eyes went down, and she turned the corner. She was always picking things up. I had never noticed it before. Now it's all I see her do. Bright blue cookie wrappers, yellow pieces of paper, green bottle caps, red fall leaves, all disappearing into the gray backpack. One day, on our silent walk home, I am not so silent. What do you do with it all? All of what? The wrappers and trash and leaves. Do you really want to know? Yes, please. Then follow me. And they go up one flight of stairs, just a little further, then another and another, and the heavy door creaks open. This is my room. Here, in her room, the sun comes to shine. It reaches in and makes her glow. It makes her collection glow as well. Each brightly colored wrapper, bit of trash and speckled leaf has a place on her walls, her ceiling, her door, they are no longer forgotten bits blowing in the wind. Along her wall, they are one. They are her sky, her beach, her village. They are beautiful. We came here for a better life. I miss home, though. I miss the sounds and smells, and I miss the colors. I am sad, but she is sad. It is beautiful, I say. She tells me stories about her sun, her ocean, her people. We sit and talk, then laugh, then talk some more. She is not so sad. She is not so alone. It feels good to be her friend. I say goodbye. She says goodbye. I'll see you tomorrow. It is true. She smiles. I smile. We smile the same. On my way home, the wind blows, strong and cold. A bright red leaf falls at my feet. I pick it up and put it in my backpack. 
And this is his collage art collection. We're now going to have our traditional sharing of joys and concerns. If you'll come up and uh, light a candle and give your name, um, uh, we will all be uh, supportive of either your joy or concern, and I'll light the first candle. And I have been a member here many years, since 1979, I think. And so I just want to light my candle in appreciation that we've been here so long and we mean so much to so many people. I'm James Dorries, and I just thought you needed to hear a story about the building of this building. I won't be here for too many more weeks, but I'll be here every Sunday that I am here. Uh, we were building this building in 1967, and Harlow Sprouse had been president a year or two before, and I was president at the time we were building it. And we had an architect, and we had a builder whose first name was Johnny. I can't remember his last name. But our plans that Johnny had agreed to build this building for $44,000, and there were metal, for, according to the plans, metal in the interior doorways, and we were meet Harlow and I were out with the architect one day while the building was being built. And uh, he said Harlow was a member of the of the uh, Sprouse law firm, a big firm, and I was a member for the other big firm, a Gibson auctioner. And so there we were with our architect, and the architect said. Uh, Johnny has come to me and uh, he says he's going to lose quite a bit of money on this building because it's only going to make him $44,000. It's going to cost him more than that to build it. So he's asked if he could leave the metal out of the interior doors to try to save a little bit. And Harlow Sprouse said, who the hell do you think you represent? You represent us, you're going to have him build this building in exact accordance with the plans and don't come back to us with any silliness about it. <laughs> A few minutes later, Harlow was gone and the architect came to me and said, I want to deal with you from here on. <laughs> so that's the story I wanted you to know. So what year was the church built? Was it 67 or 68? 67. Okay. I'm dating myself, but that's fascinating because I was born in 68. So, <laughs> My name's Clint, and I, I'm lighting two candles of concern. Um, a close family friend, Richard Okar, uh, passed away, and uh, his burial was uh, at the Rock Island, Illinois National Cemetery for Veterans. He was a Korean War veteran, and um, I'm light a candle for him and his family. And then also my good friend Stephanie in Garland, Texas. She's actually come here and visited in person and been in our service. Her uh, brother, Eddie, passed away on Friday morning. Um, so I'm lighting a candle for 
her family as well. And as part of the Social Justice Committee, we'll let you all know we're having an environmental film festival coming up June 1st and more information to follow. Thank you. I think you all know me. I'm April, just in case you don't know. I was not gone very long. Can you hear me now? Well, okay. well just what the hell. Um, there, now we know. I went, I didn't take very long off work. Uh -huh. I went to the hospital Friday morning. I had a procedure called TAVR, T-A-V-R, which is where they go up through your arteries and replace the valve in your heart. I went home yesterday. This is a candle of joy. <laughs> I feel good. <laughs> and I can see you need some more sand. <laughs> Thank you. My name is Ken Harris. I was going to do a candle of joy for April, but she beat me to it, so, <laughs> so I've got another one. Jean and I were able to have a new grandson this past week on Wednesday. Our daughter and the little baby boy are doing just very well. So we're thankful for this new life that's coming to the world. I was afraid you were going to ask that. <laughs> 17. Does anybody have 17 or more grandchildren here? Ah, uh, okay. You know, Gene and I, we're not first place on a lot of things, but we're first place on that one. <laughs> so anyway, you know, I, I actually believe that we have a, a population exp uh, problem in this world. But I don't know if I've done too much to, to help keep it down, you know. So I'm guilty. Okay, this evening, hopefully, we're going to try to start a philosophy forum. Meet here about 4 o'clock in the afternoon. And I know there's a lot of really smart people in this room. So I hope that you will come and be my teacher, okay? We're going to start out by studying truth and error. And the we're going to have five questions here we're going to try to answer. What is required for truth to exist or for error to exist? I'm going to suggest that there's two steps that must be taken to know if something is true or false. Second question, does truth exist anywhere else in the solar system or universe? You know, let's kind of broaden our perspective here. Number three, is it possible for one person to possess his own truth and another to possess her own truth wherein there are differences or contradictions? Number four, if we have time, we'll go to the word fact. How do we define the word fact? Is it possible for both facts and alternative facts to be true. <laughs> Four o'clock this afternoon. Now, if it, there's another time that's better, I'd be glad for somebody to make a suggestion. But I'm available any time today and tomorrow too. So we'll plan on starting at 4 o'clock, if that's okay. Here. Right here. Yes. Okay, thank you. My name is Cindy, and I have two brief thank yous. One is to say uh, thank you for our friends at the temple. We had a lovely evening with them last night, a lovely meal and visit, and a very short, nice um, ceremony for Purim. 
which um, their new rabbi explained to us in great detail, and it was a very delightful evening. And the other is a thank you to uh, the members of the Knowledge Seekers for underwriting the tickets for our young people to go this afternoon to see The Little Mermaid at Emerald Little Theater. It will be a joy. And perhaps next week they'll come tell you about it. One final candle um, uh, to recognize the incredible contributions uh, that James Dorries and Eileen Murphy have made to this fellowship over the years. Um, Eileen is already in Houston. James will be joining her in a few weeks, and we'll no longer have um, that inspiration that we've had for all these years and that stability. And so I want a lot of candle for that. And a candle... for the joys and concerns not expressed here this morning, but deeply felt. We're gonna have a music selection now.
Uh, we're ready for another uh, reading uh, by Donna Mosley. Georgia O'Keeffe had spent her winters painting in New York City with her husband, Albert Stieglitz, and summered at his family's estate on Lake George. She soon convinced Alfred that a shanty on the Lake George property would be ideal for her work, and she continued to paint until in the late 1920s she realized that she had painted everything there. She was tired of the many family members and friends always present, and she was dealing with some health issues. But most importantly, she had also learned of her husband's intense interest in a much younger woman. When the wife of a fellow artist suggested a trip to New Mexico in late 1929, she was ready for a return to the Southwest. This poem, from the far away, nearby, 1937, reflects her intense love for place, silence, color, and her feelings of independence and completion. It was written by Camille Cart and appeared in the journal Poetry, December 2021 edition. Make no bones about it, or better yet, make bones. Sandborn, sun-bleached, bald-faced bones, naked but for a southwest sky. I began picking up bones because there were no flowers. More than enough to fill your pockets, a treasure trove in plain sight atop a sage covered plains. In the picture taken by your lover, you pose with them, nestling them, caressing them, pressing them, brush of bone against your cheekbone. Your eyes roll back in ecstasy. Momentarily, you were someplace else. Place was a metaphysics. The word skeleton meant home. He will not follow you there. You return alone to New Mexico, to your catacomb, curio cabinet stuffed with canvases, with corpses. It's the summer of 1936 when you receive his letter. I worry. The landscape makes you lonely. But it is, it is his logic that makes you lonely. You will not bother to reply. Outside, at dusk, you paint the desert, the broken fence, the single chicken bone. Suddenly, you are struck to think how elemental they turned out to be, your life's preoccupations. One night, you dream you see yourself as if from far away, asleep and slumped on sand dunes, the color of cream. Walking backwards, you watch with fascination as your body fades into a hillock's hump, is stifled by a sun-drenched sheet. We're now going to have a moment of silence uh, with a short um, reading by Andy Greenwald. To be present, really, truly present, in art and life requires empathizing with uncertainty and wrestling with risk. 
join me in a moment of silence. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce to you today Dr. Amy Von Lintel, who's um, um, quite well known in the area because of her knowledge of Georgia O'Keeffe and her time here and how her time here affected her art. But Amy is a professor of art history and director of gender studies at West Texas A&M University. Her areas of research include modern and contemporary art of the American West, women and gender, fakes and forgeries in art, and the history of art history. Her publications include three women artists, expanding abstract expressionism in the American West, two books on Georgia O'Keeffe in Texas, and a co-authored book on Robert Smithson in Texas, along with numerous journal articles on her various research topics. Born and raised in the Midwest in Kansas City, she now lives in Amarillo with her Brewer meteorologist husband and their children adopted out of the Texas Foster System Program, along with her two dogs and two cats. Amy? Okay, thank you so much for inviting me here. I've never been to this building and uh, I hope this isn't the last time I'm here. It's really lovely. Uh, the windows remind me of Le Corbusier's chapel in, um, in France. So I'm already like in an art history mode. Okay, so I have my pointer here. Let me see if I can use it to advance. What do I point it at back here? There we go, okay. So thank you again to Claudia and everyone who brought me here. Um, so I'm putting some lines up, and you can see one of them is significantly shorter. You probably know what this, these lines represent. So O'Keeffe's long life is the blue line, and O'Keeffe's time in Texas is the yellow line. So you can see the dates there. But what I think is so interesting is how a short time in one's life can be so profoundly influential, so we'll see that. Another thing I find really interesting is when you say that she was in Texas between 1912 and 1918, she wasn't just in Texas, she was very nomadic and mobile. So for example, when she taught at the institution where I now teach, WT, she went back and forth to Canyon, between Canyon and Amarillo, because in Amarillo there was her doctor, or the movie theater, or any other kinds of adventures. Um, she also took time to vacation in Colorado and saw New Mexico for the first time. This is all during her time in Texas. She also went back to New York City, and Stieglitz had hung her first solo show on the walls of 291 in April of 1917, and during that time, she stopped in Chicago to see her brother, who was in training camp for World War I. And then she also taught over that course in the summers at UVA, University of Virginia, but only in the summers because that's when women could teach. They couldn't teach during the year. And then lastly, she came down with a pretty severe COVID-like virus in late 1917 and then recuperated in the San Antonio area. Um, the other graphic that I'm showing here is that she was taking both trains and cars as part of her travel. And you can see that when she started at WT in 1916, cars were all the rage. And what I love about this 
you know, because parking is such a big deal on campus now. <laughs> There's no parking lot. You just pulled your car up and got out, and that was the only building on campus. And Old Main had been rebuilt brand new in 1916 after the original Old Main had burnt in 1914. So this was a, a you know, big, beautiful new building on the plains with big, beautiful cars out of, outside of it. So one of the things that she writes about is how much she loved car travel. It was so adventurous for her. She talks about how her hair blows in the wind, and you can see why, right? They're wide open. You did have maybe, um, what do you call it, a windshield. I could only think of the word in French. A windshield and nothing else. But she had so many car adventures. She didn't drive herself until the New Mexico years, but she rode around in cars all the time when she was here. She also took trains because that was the main form of transportation, but she complained about how she didn't love them. But what I think is interesting too, and I love transportation history, is how it affected her art and her thinking. And so you can see that even if she didn't like riding in trains, this is a work that she painted on the right um, that is in Amarillo Museum of Art, so you can go see it. It's not on display, but Alex Gregory or the other staff members will pull it out for you anytime. And MOA is always free, so thanks to them for that. Uh, art should be publicly available. Um, but what she's doing here is that she's painting a train, but she's doing it in an abstract way, where she's using rainbow colors, which I think fit this room very beautifully too, um, in a way that the steam probably didn't look as rainbow as she saw, but she felt it, and she amps that up a little bit, and then the train engine is just a teardrop shape with that circle on it. And so, you know, at the same time that she's observing the world she lives in here, is that she is making it into works of art. She's experimenting with abstraction. So we'll continue to see that. And in the image on the left, she's there with friends, but it's hard to see, but she's holding a tumbleweed. So, you know, she was always engaging with nature. So one of the reasons that we know how she felt or what she saw or what she thought when she was in this time in Texas is because she wrote prolifically. She wrote most often to the man who would become her husband, Alfred Stieglitz, but she wrote to other people as well. So one of my missions when I got here, and I wasn't an O'Keefe scholar until I got here in 2010, was to let her speak for herself. And so this book means a lot to me because it's her words um, taken from those letters. She donated those letters to the Beinecke Library at Yale so that people could study them. But she also said that we couldn't open them until 20 years after her death because she didn't want anyone getting grumpy you know, <laughs> about what she had said. Um, so she left some time for us there. So I would suggest this book if you want to know more. So this is one of her letters. And you can see her handwriting is quite impossible to read. It, you know, in addition to being a poetic writer, she's also a beautiful calligrapher, you know, like almost a drafts person of, of letter writing. So I transcribed it because it's hard to see what the heck she's saying. She writes, very tame beside the red one. Very, very tame. I just noticed that the drawings I made last Sunday, no, should say most of them, have the same line arrangement. And then she writes this wobbly X. It's what I've been painting on. So what I love about this is that in the letter, she's describing painting, and she's drawing little sections of what she sees. And she was in the canyon. So you can see she starts doing these graphite drawings, like the one on the left, where the X form is in there because of the um, layers of the canyon walls. And then she expands beyond the, char the graphite to charcoal, the one at the top, where she's really pushing the trees into this bubble form, almost like champagne bubbles or something. And then the uh, clouds, which you don't even see any clouds in the first drawing, become like paving stones. They're these very funny cloud shapes. And then down below, what she does, and she does this throughout her whole life, she'll find an image in the world and then use those colors and then invert the colors in the design. So here, the trees, which were bubbles before, become these kind of like oblong red forms, almost like some sort of army. And then the walls of the canyon turn green in the back. So she's using that design, that X sort of shape design, and playing with it. 
And then finally, she comes to this um, work that we have in the Panhandle Plains, the red landscape that you can see. It's beautifully reinstalled. I'll show you an image of the installation in a minute. But you can see how that X form is dead center in that work. And you know she's returned to the red of those cliff faces and the green of the trees, but the red isn't the red we see in Canyon or in the Canyon, in Palo Alto Canyon. It's the red she felt. It's much more bloody, it's much more passionate. So she's playing with forms and design and color in a way that is you know, like any leading abstractionist, modernist artist. So here's the reinstallation, and um, I, it just reopened, and it's a really, really beautiful room. This is the Texas Gallery at PPHM that was redesigned by my dear friend and colleague, Dina Craighead, the art curator there. And she boldly painted the walls blue, like they're deep, kind of slate blue, they're beautiful. And I don't know if you can see where that O'Keefe is hanging, but it's anchored at the corner. And this is a bold thing to do because usually people come into the museum and it's like the Mona Lisa or something. Where's the O'Keefe? We have to find it. And it used to be in this shrine, right? So like isolated. But Dina wanted, number one, O'Keefe to be a Texas artist, which she was when she was in our area. She was our artist. And so she's in the text gallery. But also she wanted her to be seen in conjunction with other Texas artists where she highlights their qualities of beauty and abstraction, and they highlight hers. She didn't work in a vacuum, so I really love this installation. I invite you to go there and look at those works. Okay, so O'Keefe had trouble staying inside. We'll see that she writes that in a letter later, but um, so not only did she love driving around in cars, and remember there weren't that many roads, so bumping along dirt roads, right? But she would get out of the car and she would hike. Now, this was a time when women wore skirts. She. We have pictures of O'Keefe wearing pants, but she didn't go all around town. Um, but she wears flat shoes because she wants to walk out in nature and experience that. She leads her students around on hikes. So she says here, I climbed and scrambled about till I was out of breath many times over and felt very little. Such a tiny little part of what I could see had worn me out. Yes, I was very small and very puny and helpless and all around was so big and impossible. It seemed as if the steep places, the faraway parts, the ragged little cedars and uncertain stones all laughed at me for attempting to get over any of it. What I love about this too is that O'Keefe was very in tune with her own smallness, but then the bigness of the world. So this idea of self versus what's bigger or beyond. Um, and so, you know, you're having philosophy, thoughts later, that kind of thing. She was a philosopher in a way, and she was highly spiritual. She writes about how she doesn't want to go to church in Canyon like she's expected to do, but she wants to think about what's beyond and what's bigger than herself. So she paints lots of works from the canyon. I bring these two up because they are, on the one hand, pretty representational. You can see that she's painting an actual mesa. She's using green for trees and sort of, again, that red for the canyon walls. And then the one with the crows, you can see the canyon in it. But the other thing that she does is she really plays through those colors, right? She very carefully picks purples that when you go there, you see them, but you have to look kind of closely to catch it. And then she's varying the reds through oranges and kind of wine color burgundies. Um, so, you know, her color palette is so sophisticated even in this early year. Um, and then she also continues to look at that color palette when she's in New Mexico. These are from Ghost Ranch uh, when she had a home there. Now, my argument is that she fell in love with the canyon lands and their landscape, the aridity and the red uh, colors and the color palette when she was here in our area and then sought that back out in New Mexico later where there was more of an art community. There wasn't as much of an art community here but she doesn't find New Mexico out of nowhere. She finds it because she was connected to it here. And then what you see her painting down below over and over again is the Pedernal, which is this flat top mesa in New, in New Mexico. And she actually writes about how she believes that if she paints it enough, God will give it to her. So again, that connection between her and her artistic production and her um, spirituality with nature. 
Okay, so I promised you this letter would come back. Another letter that's quite hard to read, but what she is saying here is, we have been having wonderful warm days, sometimes a bit dirty, windy. Look at how she makes the windy slide down a hill or something. I mean, she knows our wind, but really wonderful. It's really springtime, pretty hard to stay in the house. I haven't been in much except when at school. Good night. And I love this one because we're feeling this right now, right? It's windy, but it's warmer, and you can see the trees flowering, and we know our seasons, and she went through all the seasons here, so she was very aware of that. And then she ends this with the idea that I'm only in when I'm in school. Remember, she came here for the job. She has to work. She has to go to school and teach. So where was she teaching? Well, fall 1912 to 14, she taught at the brand new Amarillo School District. There was one building. She taught both younger kids and high school kids. Um, but that's also when she was teaching in the summers at UVA. And then she comes back to be the head of the art department, the art department of one, it was just her, at WT in September 1916, and she goes uh, and teaches there steadily until she leaves with that COVID-like sickness. Um, and what you can see in the image on the right, I pointed to who she is in that faculty picture from the Mirage, which was the yearbook of WT, is that she's at chapel. Hmm. Well, at the time, WT students and faculty were expected to go to chapel once a week. But their chapel was a lot more like this than you would think, right? She got to speak about Cubist artists at the chapel sessions. Sometimes she didn't want to go always, and she didn't like the presumption that they would force her to do so. But it was also a kind of forum for knowledge and learning that she participated in. And I think she learned to be a very good speaker by doing these chapel talks. So what else was happening at the time? Of course, World War I, right? By April 1917, remember when she was on the train going back to New York City, that's when America was brought into the war. And so suddenly the WT students, only the men were getting on trains and leaving for training camps. The women were taught to do canning and other kinds of wartime things. And she witnessed all of that. So. She came to Texas for a job, but she also came to Texas for another reason that I love. The Wild West. <laughs> she writes this in her autobiography, which she penned in 1976, so on the end of that timeline that I started with. Texas has always been a sort of faraway dream. When we were children, my mother read to us every evening and on Sunday afternoons, I had listened for many hours to boys' stories stories of the Wild West of Texas, Kit Carson and Billy the Kid, it had always seemed to me that the West must be wonderful. There was no place I knew that I would rather go. So when I had a chance to teach there, off I went to Texas, not knowing much about teaching. So what we have here, I love this because I'm teaching a class through the Center for the Studies of the American West on Tascosa right now. So I've learned a lot about that town. I'm really interested in it. And this is a picture of the cowboys bellying up to the bar, the bar that we still have at Panhandle Plains in the storage. Um, but I also love that, and there's you know, this presumption, Billy the Kid was in Tascosa. You might or might not know that. So she's referencing stories that took her not just to the West, but to our area fascinating, and then she winds up here. But then she also does this self-deprecating move of, well, I didn't know much about teaching. And that might be true, but she became an excellent educator, excellent educator. And we have evidence of this because her students did interviews later in their lives that are recorded as oral interviews at PPHM. You can listen to them, they're wonderful. And they talk about how inspirational she was for their whole lives. They didn't forget her walking around talking about a leaf, or they didn't forget her teaching them about design qualities, even in a dress that you would wear. So wonderful um, evidence for that. And then O'Keefe also wrote about how much she loved teaching, including youngsters, because there was a training school at WT where she was teaching young kids, because at the training school, the uh, WT was a teacher's college. They would do teacher's training there, and then the area kids could go there for elementary all the way to high school. And um, this painting is this the weirdest little painting, right? It's this chicken, and it looks like one of her kids did it, but I almost see it like a demonstration of childlike wonder with an animal and flowers and abstraction 
and you know, imitating, she writes about her young kids doing images of weird spiders and you know, just what little kids do. But I love this painting because it makes me think of that moment. So the theme I started with was the idea that she has this short moment here, but it's inspirational for her lifetime. And what you can see in these two paintings is they both post-date her Texas years. So 1919, she was in New York, and 1953, she was in New Mexico, but she continued to think about the plains. And what we know about the one on the left is that it's representational of a sound memory a memory of cattle that as they were loaded onto the rail cars in Amarillo, um, well, no, actually in Canyon, she talks about this, the, uh, the calves would cry out. And so that kind of cry she compares to the penitentes in New Mexico. So a sound memory of the plains. And then she returns to that with a different color palette in 53. But I think the distinctive marks are those saw blade edge Parts that are really interesting. And I think it's fitting that they use this for the cover of the book because it's almost a declaration of how, yes, she had this moment in Texas, but it lives on because it postdates her Texas time. So when she was here, she explored form and color, you know, canyon shapes or the big horizon and big sky that we know about, or sunrises and sunsets. And she plays with those colors, you know, almost like a fauvist, anti-naturalistic, bright, brilliant color. But yet, you find a sunset, you see them too, right? So it's sort of, we know that it's natural, and we know that it's more than that too. Um, and she continues to do this with the Evening Star series. That's She looks at the Venus star that rises after the sun sets, and she starts making these snail shell series images, but... My favorite one, I think, perhaps, is the one in the upper right with almost the rainbow in it. And you can see the watercolor mark in that kind of light green to yellow zone in the upper right where it's a pooling, excuse me, of the watercolor that's in the shape of a heart. And she left it, right? She doesn't get to say, oh, I don't want that. She's very willing to experiment. And what we have is a legacy that she left where other women artists came to this area for jobs as well, but then found the color to be inspirational. So you have Elaine de Kooning who came here to teach and discovered the sunsets and you know, she would go to bullfights in Juarez when she taught in this area. And you can see the color palette is similar and the forms are very abstract. And then Louise Nevelson started painting her boxes gold, either for the golden spread that we know of or... <laughs> And her sisters declare this, but they said, oh yeah, it was because of the ranch houses had gilded all their faucets to show how much money they had, you know. So, but the idea of this, this area being um, artistically inspirational, that legacy lives on. And you can read about that in this book that I wrote with one of my best friends and colleagues, Bonnie Roos of the English department. Um, it's beautifully color illustrated, so it gives you a sense of, again, how vibrant our colors are here for these artists. Um, returning to this image again, this red landscape, one of the things that she writes about is how the red landscape is similar to her body. She sees her body like a landscape, and she sees the landscape like a body, and she does a series of nudes that are of her own body in the um, rental room in the Shirley House in Canyon. She's doing it in that upstairs room. And she plays through, sometimes her body becomes blue and the background becomes red, so she does that same thing. But the idea of filling a space in a beautiful way, whether it is landscapes or bodies, she was always a graphic designer in addition to being a painter. And so when you turn this painting upside down, it still works. If you put a pinhole in the middle of it, you can spin it like a pinwheel. Remember her X forms in that letter. So, you know, she's going back and forth between nature and abstraction, nature and picture making, um, but it's also between self and something bigger. I wanna to return to that theme a little bit. And then we have another body. This is her body that she paints in kind of a pinkish red, a little bold pinkish red here. And it's fitting that they use that for the cover of this book, the O'Keeffe Watercolors book, that I have an essay in that talks about her time in Texas, and it reproduces exact size match and color match all of her Texas work. So it's a really, really beautiful art book. Um, 
But what you can see here is that she could be compared to other abstractionists, other modernists all across the world at the time, including um, artists like the Futurists, Bala and the Bregalia brothers, who were using repetitive imagery to mimic dynamism, movement. Um, you know, and they were really interested in machine imagery. O'Keeffe wasn't as an interested in machine imagery, but she was interested in movement. Look how her body moves in space across those forms. And this is my last slide. And what I wanted to do here is point out how uniquely O'Keeffe experienced the specialness of our area with its sublimity. And what I mean by that is when I teach the sublime, I talk about how it minimizes our bodies as humans and maximizes nature. And that could be a storm, it could be a mountain. Now, these are tiny little images, like this size, like very small. But yet, she captures the sublimity of our huge skies on the right because that is the horizon and a blue sky, right? Like it's this ongoing um, orb rather than a rectangle. And she makes the horizon an empty part of the paper, so a negative space. And I love that because the horizon isn't a line. We know that, right? It's this perspective of infinity. And it, she embeds that into a scene that's also something someone can recognize as, oh, that's the horizon in our sky, right? So it's totally abstract and yet totally realistic. And the one on the left, what she does there is captures the night sky with this infinitude of stars. Each star is, a again, a negative space in the paper, but it, they're all individual. So it's kind of a commentary on the individuality of each of us and yet the collective of all of us having to share a space. And then again, that horizon line and infinite, you know, infinitude. She's talking about tininess and bigness and life and what comes after. She writes about that. And so I think that, you know, leaving us with these images that are some of the best modernist images of the period, but also they're about our area and they're about the very things that we want to think about in this space. Thank you. Do you do any Q&A? You don't do any question and answer? I'm done now. Uh, not beca okay, okay. because of time, no, we would. Uh, at this time, we will have our offertory. Um, if somebody will pass along the not quite silver plate. May we give this offering to sustain and grow the life and mission of this congregation, and may we give in love and in hope. Uh, we have announcements. We have Transgender Day of Visibility Celebration coming up on Saturday, March the 30th from noon until 6. That will be at uh, Old Sunset Center. And um, there will be performances by the House of Misfits and several vendors. Um, our worship committee is arranging an informal gathering for Rever Reverend Laura Brandis, who's going to be coming in on Saturday, March the 30th at 6.30. Uh, the setting will be informal. You'll order and pay at the counter and then join Reverend Brandis and the gang at the communal table. Uh, let John uh, Hintz know if you might be attending, and Fuzzies is in the shopping center at 34th and Coulter. 
uh, our upcoming events, Craft for a Cause, is the third Saturday of each month. Is it already passed? Yes. Okay, at 2 p.m. Our Nothing Much Buddhist group meets every Monday at 7.30 p.m. on Zoom. Our book club uh, meets the fourth Tuesday of each month, and we'll be meeting this coming Tuesday on George Saunders. Is that right, Dick? And um, our Knowledge Seekers class meets every Sunday at 10 a.m. in Chandler Hall. Oh, the philosophy discussion group will be meeting today at 4 p.m. And our upcoming services, we'll have Reverend Laura Brandis from Dallas. We'll have Reverend Art Severance from San Antonio. And then we'll have Reverend Dr. Chuck Fisher. So we're going to be reverended um, a lot um, this coming month. Um, I'm going to extinguish the chalice and um, with these words art and life really are the same and both can only be about a spiritual journey a path towards a reunion with a supreme creator with God with the divine and this is true no matter how unlikely how strange how unorthodox one's particular life path might appear to oneself or others at any given moment. Genesis P. Orridge, and I suggest you look them up. Okay, if you will stand and we'll sing the closing song. May the fellowship of this hour touch and move our lives until we come again together. And Amy will hang around for questions, um, so please feel free to come and talk with her.